thanks for coming and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to have you here in person and on Zoom for uh, the presentation of A-Carcinome. And um, let me introduce myself because maybe you don't know me. I'm Chiara Palmieri, uh, veterinary pathologist at the UQ School of Veterinary Science and <clears throat> project leader of A-Carcinome. Um, this is, so the Australian Companion Animal Register of Cancers is the um, first nationwide uh, that asset on cancer cases in dogs and cats, supported by the Australian Research Data Commons. I don't want to talk too much because we have so many things going on, many speakers. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. If you need to go to the bathroom, it's a long walk, but you can make it. So you just need to go out on the right, because I did the walking before, just to make sure that I had that right. And then straight and then right again. Um, at the end of the event, um, we're going to provide a refreshment. So you're welcome to stay and do some networking. So it would be uh, nice to have a chat with you. Um, today, we're going to have a first uh, session with a welcome speech with five speakers. And then myself talking about presenting the dashboard and the uh, Australian uh, Companion Animal Register of Cancers. And then Ricardo Suarez Megalayesh talking about uh, the impact of cancer data on environmental health and epidemiology. So let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Melissa Brown. She's the Executive Dean of the UQ Faculty of Science. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Chiara and um, Ricardo, and lovely to be here this morning uh, to celebrate the launch of the first national dog and cat cancer database, the uh, Australian Companion Animal Registry of Cancers, a carcinom, right? So my name is Melissa Brown uh, and I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science at the University of Queensland, uh, which is home to the School of Veterinary Science. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging and recognise their very significant and ongoing contribution. Secondly, I would like to welcome you to the University of Queensland. Now, my notes from a couple of days ago said that we were the first and largest university in Queensland and one of the top three universities in Australia. But as of yesterday, we have been informed that according to uh, the uh, Australian Financial Review, UQ is the best university in Australia. So we're very, very, very proud of that, really wonderful. And that represents not only research excellence, but also excellence in teaching, which is a very... Um, uh, important part of what universities do. Uh, so um, the university is especially proud of the School of Veterinary Science due to its excellence in teaching research and in building a really strong uh, staff culture. And I really commend the school for their focus on that. It's really, really, really important. Um, the uh, Discipline of Veterinary Science at the University of Queensland is ranked as number 46 in the world, so congratulations to the school. Um, and it leads and contributes to a wide range of areas, including animal health and welfare, uh, with a strong focus on the epidemiology of infectious disease and animal cancers. Uh, and as you know, today's event will focus on the latter. So in preparing for today, I did a little bit of reading. My past life, I was a cancer researcher, so I'm very much familiar with the importance of uh, cancer registries, but I thought I'd do a little bit of uh, research on that just so I, I fully understood the, the really, really great significance of the work that the team is doing. So the idea of cataloguing illnesses to better understand diseases dates back to at least the 16th century when the English Crown apparently appointed elderly epidemic-scarred women to travel the countryside in search of dead and dying. And these ancient matrons uh, would then publish weekly bills of mortality for each, each um, parish. 
tabulating deaths by causes such as the purples, which is probably leukaemia, consumption, which was probably cancer, and of course the plague. As our understanding of cancer uh, as a leading cause of mortality in both animals and humans has developed over centuries, enormous progress has been made in understanding the dynamics of this disease from populations through to molecules. This progress has been greatly assisted by the establishment of comprehensive and accessible human cancer registries uh, that can be used to understand the epidemiology of the disease, including incidence, distribution, risk factors and control measures. And where clinical samples are available to explore the pathology genetics biochemistry of certain tumours through registries, it has been possible to look for associations between these biomarkers and disease characteristics, progression, responsiveness to treatment and outcomes, which is really very important. Uh, so the first modern hospital-based cancer registry was created in the United States. This is human cancers in 1926, almost 100, and 100 years ago. Uh, and since then, hundreds of registries have been established across the globe. Uh, and through the wonder of modern technology have been linked to comprehensive databases that make even more powerful as a resource to uh, study and improve health outcomes. Access to quality data uh, is crucial and I note our sponsors um, here today sponsoring not just the event but also um, a carcinom. Uh, is, uh, is critical uh, offering clinical and epidemiological uh, evidence to assess the effectiveness of existing cancer treatment programs and prioritise intervention strategies. So while human cancer registries have thrived in modern times, veterinary cancer registries have historically been sporadic, short-lived and uncoordinated, much akin to the early days of human registries, despite the fact that cancer is a major cause of death in animals. Over the last 15 years, however, animal cancer registries have emerged in multiple countries, including uh, Australia, uh, and A carcinoma is Australia's first national registry of animal cancer occurrences, backed by real-time data from pathology uh, labs and universities. Focusing on cancers in dogs and cats, A carcinoma seeks to establish sustainable, unified and accessible data asset uh, this resource will prove invaluable for identifying patterns and trends in both animals and human cancers, uh, as well as quantifying the role of predisposing risk factors, enhancing our understanding of cancers in pets uh, and potentially improving outcomes. So I'd just like to finish by congratulating uh, everyone who's been involved in this great initiative and wish you all the best for a terrific event today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. A um, little bit of risk in the order of speakers. Melissa goes first, so has complete freedom about what you get to say. Now the rest of us are crossing out lines in our talks. No, no, <laughs> not, at, not at all. <laughs> Look, I, I won't take very long. I just, um, the A carcinome, the Australian Companion Animal Register of Cancer, has been a long time in the planning. And there's a wonderful synergy here, and it's covered by the two project leads that we've got here. I'm very, I'll come to the, the broader project team in a minute, but I just want to acknowledge that the synergy reflects the two lead agents between big data-driven epidemiology expertise, and I'll leave you to guess which one of the two lead agents that might be, and advanced oncopathology expertise in cancer diagnosis, treatment and prevention. And Melissa's summarised some of the issues around there really nicely, I thought. Wonderful to see that the platform is now ready to receive an expanding contribution of data in real time, and that's really exciting. A carcinoma is part of a global initiative, the Global Initiative of Veterinary Cancer Surveillance, and so we are part of a broader global span um, effort to improve the vision, the aspirational vision, improving pet care through cancer data. The partnership with the Australian Cancer Atlas provides a one health opportunity of examining the incidence, distribution and risk factors of cancers in Australian animals alongside similar information about human cancers. 
offering opportunities for transdisciplinary comparative research with One Health benefits. The project is an example of the beating heart of why we do what we do. The central role that animals play in human well-being and the broader One Health benefits of bringing our amazing capability and capacity to focus on health and well-being outcomes. So on behalf of the School of Veterinary Science and the University of Queensland, I just add my congratulations to Chiara and Ricardo, but I also want to acknowledge the University of Sydney, the University of Adelaide, Murdoch University, Gribbles and IDEX, and we've got some of our partner entities in the room today, and the broader team for turning the aspirational vision into reality. And I look forward to the registry growing in scale and importance. Thank you. Um, then now let me introduce uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor uh, Research Infrastructure, Paul Bonington. Thank you, Chiara. Thank so, you. I'm Paul Bonington, Pro Vice Chancellor, Research Infrastructure. My colleagues here at UQ call me Bono from UQ. Um, I too would actually like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, paying respects to elders past, present and emerging. So as someone who has responsibility with uh, uh, for UQ's research infrastructure, I actually often take opportunities like this to remind everyone that research infrastructure is not about the big machines. It's not about the big microscopes. Uh, it's not about the glass houses, but it's about people and partnerships. People is what make our research infrastructure world-class and uh, partnerships enable discoveries to occur that wouldn't otherwise happen. Good research happens between organisations and institutions. Good research goes beyond the institutional boundaries. It's about connections. Data registries are a catalyst for those connections. This registry underpins research connections between organisations and leads to discoveries that wouldn't otherwise happen. And this will be transformative. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that eventually will lead to new advancements in treatments that will improve healthcare and pet care, sorry. Um, so in many ways, this is an Australian first, but it, it is a national registry uh, for cat and dog cancers. It is the first of its type. But it's also part of a national journey, which I had the privilege of being at the start of 16 years ago. So 16 years ago, I arrived at Monash University as director of e-research, and my first role was to chair uh, the establishment of a new national initiative that maximises the value of research data. That national initiative was the Australian National Data Service, or ANS. And the following decade saw the, the federal government invest over $100 million into establishing a national collaborative research data infrastructure to create the foundation that made data more findable more accessible, more interoperable, and more reusable. And some of you might have heard this referenced with the acronym FAIR data. So the Australian National Data Service was a precursor to the Australian Research Data Commons. And it's very heartening for me to see our sector and the federal government continue after 16 years to, to support this type of collaborative research infrastructure and uh, particularly as we're seeing through the Australian Research Data Commons. Uh, and now, of course, this strong support from the federal government doesn't just stop at data infrastructure, but it also extends to the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. So this includes infrastructure ranging from imaging, microscopy, earth observation, astronomy, and bioproduction from, for everything from sustainable energy through to advanced therapeutics. So INCRIS to me is probably the most important thing we do as a nation, but I am very heavily biased. Uh, it recently started its next five year investment cycle, which will see the federal government invest $2.2 billion over the next five years. These investments are guided by the National Research Infrastructure Roadmap, 
which in its very latest iteration spoke about the importance of five critical step changes to our research infrastructure. Near the top of that list, it uh, talked about the criticality of the digital aspects of everything we do. Of course, digitization is fundamentally changing everything we do. This digital registry is an excellent example of that occurring in pet care. And of course, we're just actually at the beginning of an exciting transformative journey that will see new opportunities, new technologies and techniques evolve with the introduction of this registry. Uh, and those include, for example, new forms of data linkage across modalities through to AI techniques applied to, for example, diagnosis um, of uh, pet diseases. So I'm, of course, delighted to see the establishment of this registry. I'm greatly looking forward to hearing about the impact that it will have not only in pet care, but how we might approach employing this type of idea to other disciplines. And congratulations to Chiara and, uh, and the team and our partner organisations for this initiative. And I do extend my thanks to the ARDC and INCRIS for their strong support in making this project happen. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was a perfect segue. Uh, it set the stage for me perfectly. Um, thank you all very much for having me here today. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today and pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants. As you may or may not be aware now, but the Australian Research Data Commons is working in partnership with the research community to establish enduring digital infrastructure to support Australia's future research needs. We're aiming to accelerate research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis and retention of high quality data assets. We're building a research data commons that brings together people, skills and data with related resources such as storage, compute and software to ensure Australian researchers have access to high quality national data assets, platforms, infrastructure, policies, people and training to transform the lives of our community. ARDC recognises though that the necessary scale of infrastructure and underpinning multi-party collaborations can't emerge entirely from individual research organisation investment effort and activity. So through our Australian Data Partnerships Program, we've built strategic partnerships with organisations across the research sector, leveraging existing research and administrative investment and ensuring ongoing sustainability and stewardship of the national data asset. The Australian Research Data Commons is very pleased to have partnered with Chiara and Ricardo and her team at the University of Queensland to deliver this outstanding piece of national digital infrastructure as part of the Australian Data Partnerships Program. Six university veterinary schools and two leading veterinary pathology providers uh, have also been instrumental in this project. Um, and that includes QUT and the University of Sydney, James Cook University, the University of Adelaide, Murdoch University and veterinary pathology providers, Scribbles and IDEX. We recognise that data collections can be challenging for researchers to access, use and combine when that data isn't uh, fair or doesn't reflect the fair principles. The internationally recognised fair principles provide guidance to researchers and others around making sure that data is open as possible and more specifically that it is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. In that vein, the Carcinon project sought to harmonise integrate data access across a diverse range of data sources, and they very successfully leveraged ARDC's vocabulary expertise, um, and I'd like to acknowledge Rowan Brownlee uh, for that also, and, um, and our vocabulary services, Research Vocabularies Australia, um, to build a vet cancer vac vocabulary, um, and that was a very impressive piece of work, and which they should be congratulated on. A carcinom provides a missing piece in the infrastructure puzzle for researchers and the veterinary community and helps us to answer those key questions that could not answer, be answered sorry, before. Questions such as, what is the most common tumour in dogs in Australia? Which age group or which breed is more at risk of cancer risk in our environment or is more at risk of specific tumours? 
The answers to these questions are fundamental to our understanding of disease in our closest animal companions and the development of a range of treatments designed to improve in outcomes for this population. And importantly, animal cancers can be a sentinel to cancer risk in our own environment. For the last four years, ARDC has been running a range of open calls that have given us a unique insight into the digital research infrastructure needs of the Australian community and which has influenced our priorities ongoing. From the work that we did on these open calls, including the Australian Data Partnerships Program, we know that we're currently unable to meet the demand of the research community for digital research infrastructure. So the ARDC's future strategy is based around the concept of thematic research data commons that enables us to support the maximum number of researchers through a small number of strategic priority areas. If you like, that's a fabric of national research infrastructure capabilities selected strategically rather than using a competitive process and co-designed with the research community. Out of that's emerged three research data commons with, uh, in the themes around environment, health and the humanities and social sciences. Projects under these thematic research data commons are just now entering the identification and planning stages. So I'd encourage you to take an interest in these developments and subscribe to our newsletter. That's a great way to keep up to date with what ARDC is doing. Congratulations again to the CARSNOM team on this outstanding achievement. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll make this pretty brief. All my um, eminent speakers before me have actually said a lot, a lot more than I can. Um, and we'll get to the important part of the presentation. My name is Geeta Saini and I'm a director of the Board of Australian Veterinary Association. The AVA represents over 8,500 veterinarians from all corners of the profession. And its mission is to champion and empower the veterinary profession, providing a national voice, education, community and support. The Australian Companion Animal Registry of Cancers being launched today is an exciting initiative which will give the Australian veterinary community incidence and prevalence data of cancers in our pets to help guide diagnosis and treatment decisions. I'm a small animal general practitioner on the Sunshine Coast here in Queensland and cancer is something I see nearly every day in practice. Diagnoses and treatments have changed exponentially in the 43 years since I graduated from this university, and a single national database of cases will be an amazing tool. Identifying with real data the most common cancers in dogs and cats will also enable pharmaceutical companies to focus on development of treatments that can make the most impact. Other countries, for example, US and Norway, have started to develop databases for companion animal disease. But this database will, be, will capture local Australian information. Our companion animal genetics differ from those elsewhere, as do the prevalence and incidence of many diseases, including cancer. It's wonderful to see the collaboration between our leading veterinary schools and pathology providers in this project, which will, for the first time, be able to identify the differences and similarities between cancer in our dogs and cats compared to the rest of the world. This information will be a tremendous aid to research and disease surveillance in both animal and human cancers. The AVA is extremely proud to give its support to the Australian Companion Animal Registry of Cancers. The information gathered in real time will be incredibly beneficial for companion animals and veterinarians with its Australian focus and reach. And so I'd also like to say, please let the AVA know what the association can do to help Chiara and Ricardo and anybody else in this important project. Thank you. I want to present to you the actual ACARSINOM dashboard. You can have access to the dashboard using even the QR code that you can find in the, on the brochure and on the pull-up banner. Um, now, I know that you are all waiting to see how a carcinoma looks like, but you need to be a bit patient <laughs> because I'm doing something that is slightly different compared to what we normally do. So, you know, the acknowledgement section is usually at the end of the presentation. And while today I'm going to have my thank you slides at the beginning, because I think that so I, we are very grateful for all the uh, people who help to make this project possible. So I wanted to give full credits to all of them. That's why you need to be patient and, but well, it's coming. The, dash, the dashboard is coming. So 
First of all, I just want to thank uh, ARDC. I must say that our relationship has been great because ARDC is not just the funding body, but they've been real research partners. So I had the opportunity to talk to them many times. They've been troubleshooting the issues that I had, we had along the way. They've been, th that was really a very good research partnership. In particular, I want to thank Catherine Reese and Siobhan, uh, but also Joe and the communication team because they helped me with the communication angle and I don't know anything about communication and marketing. So they've been very good in supporting us uh, for the communication strategies of ACARCINOM. Rowan uh, has been very patient with me, uh, with my big vocabulary, because in order to have a database in place, we had to train the system. We had to create this research vocabulary with thousands and thousands of names of tumors and names of sites of the tumors. So uh, Rona, Rowan has been uh, good in understanding uh, where, what the issues were in terms of setting up a research vocabulary for cancers in animals. And then Paul Murphy, who gave some advice on the design of the logo as well. Then we want to thank the University of Queensland, uh, in particular the Faculty of Science, School of Veterinary Science, and Queensland Alliance One Health Science for the help and support during these, the last two years. And those are the core people of the project. So these are all the research partners and members of the ACARCINOM research management team. Um, some of them are here today. I'm very happy to see them finally face to face. And so I want to thank individually all of them, starting from Ricardo Suarez Magalaj, uh, from the School of Vet Science. Um, you know, epidemiology and pathology, they, they, they are quite, they can integrate very well together. Sometimes we have lots of discussion about data because we have different views, but it's been, it has been very great to work with him because he, had, he was able to fill my knowledge gap in data science and epidemiology. Then I want to thank Anne Piston from the University of Adelaide, Philippa McLaren and Thelma Meering from IDEX, Kerry Mangerson, is she's here today? Yeah, Kerry from QUT. She's also coordinating the Australian Cancer Atlas, and that's quite important for comparative studies. Attracta and Andrew from Gribbles Veterinary Pathology, Mark Krogenberry. Krokenberger uh, and Peter Bennett from the University of Sydney, and finally Megan Bruce and Gabriele Rossi from Murdoch University. So those are all the research partners, all the data providers, and I, I want to thank them for the patient and even because, you know, having me sending requests and emails almost every week has been quite painful, I think, <laughs> in the last few years. And then, um, I know it's a very long list, but these are all the people that help uh, with the project. Uh, starting from Rose and Leslie from UQITS. Um, I still remember the very first meeting we had, even before submitting the proposal to ARDC, and they were talking in a jargon that I couldn't understand. So they were quite important in providing that type of support in terms of uh, UQ policy or software development. Uh, the technical support that we had from them was really great. And then uh, Matt and Mike are actually the key players who were able to first understand our pathology reports, and that's not easy. <laughs> and then to be able to set up a platform for data extraction, and they were the guys who really built the ACARCINOM dashboard. Uh, Donata, she's here today. She is the graphic designer who designed this beautiful logo. And Kate helped me with the organization of the launch event. Sahil Arora with the analysis of few data sets for ACARCINOM. And then I had a big help from the UQ Faculty of Science Engagement and Communication team, Eleanor, Danny, and Dominic. 
again, for setting up the website and the social media platforms. And all those things that you can see here today, the tote bag, pull up banner, the brochure, they being created by UQ Office of Marketing and Communication and printed by the UQ Print Whitney Corp. And then there are some exciting things coming up. Um, we are preparing some educational and promotional material uh, as part of the ARDC Community Connect program. And we're working with Matthew, Mary, and Harrison from the UQ video production team to make some nice video. And you will have uh, a video coming up today so you can see what we are uh, working on. Um, so the first question that I'm usually get that I'm usually getting when I'm talking about cancer registration is why are you doing it? So why we needed a carcinoma? Um, so you, you need to think about that. We do have a huge population of animals. We have roughly nine million uh, nine million dogs and cats in Australia, but we don't know much about the incidence of cancer or uh, predisposition of cancer risk factors in Australia. So of course we can read textbook, we can go and have uh, you know, a read on the literature or papers, publications, but that's not enough. That might not be enough because it's not applicable to what we have here. And this is what Gita said before. So what you have in other countries or what you have in the literature might not be transferred to the Australian scenario. So there is a huge gap there. So what we wanted to do is fill in that knowledge gap. All the information that, all the answer uh, to the questions that you have on the slide there, they can uh, be answered through a cancer registry. So if we want to know what's the common cancer in Australia today, or what's the state with the highest incidence of cancer, or what's the city, suburb in which you have that particular cancer, or the highest number of one particular cancer, or what are the demographic risk factors of cancer, all those answers are coming through a standardized, comprehensive uh, system of data capture and storage and analysis. That is the basic foundation of cancer registration. Um, so this is a summary. So, and then another question that I'm getting is usually, uh, can you get the same information from other cancer registries in animals? Not really, that's my answer. First, because we had many cancer registries in the past, and I tried to summarize everything in this slide, and maybe there, are something, there is something missing there. But as Melissa said, they're not there anymore. They've been discontinued for many different reasons. It could be lack of funding, lack of commitment, or engagement. Um, so all those cancer registries uh, are there like as a data source, but not, they're not up and running. We do have some cancer registries in place today, and in Italy, in Portugal, at Onconet, and uh, Take Charge in US, and we have partnership with them. So making sure that we are all on the same page. Uh, but again, if I'm getting data uh, from dogs and pets in Portugal, that's not the same. Uh, as the Australian population of animals. Um, but this graph is also interesting because it tells you that in the last 10 years, there has been a growing interest in setting up initiatives for uh, taking a look at cancer data. And I think this is just part of the, this new era of big data. So taking advantage of huge data sets that can transform big data into smart data. So we are in a way aligned with what's happening today. So these uh, huge, uh, many initiatives, and I had uh, other examples of cancer registries that are starting now. So um, a carcinoma is 
well aligned with this global interest in cancer registration. And this is where carcino a carcinoma is coming from. So um, it's setting up a cancer database using uh, data from UQ, Marduk University, University of Adelaide, University of Sydney, Gribbles, and IDEX. And those data are imported into the platform where there's a system of automated analysis and parsing. All the data are de-identified, so we can't go back to the address or owner's name or name of the animal. And at the end, uh, the data are accepted and committed to the final database. And this is just a screenshot of um, how the system is extracting data. So from the different uh, data sets, and they are quite different. So the system is able to recognize what's coming from UQ, Sydney, or uh, Murdoch, or Gribbles, extracting data about the animal. So we will have um, data about the date of birth, or postcode, uh, sex, and castration status, and breed or age, and that's the minimum data requirements for cancer registration. And then the system is also recognizing names of the tumors and site of the tumor. And this is an automatic system. Uh, so it recognizes that there is a mustard tumor, where it is, and also the grade. And again, this was possible because the machine has been trained using a vocabulary of all the different breeds, all the different uh, site of the tumor and names of the tumor. And we also had the certainty level because we wanted to take a look at how good the pathologists are, and we are pretty good, because there are not many low certainty diagnoses. But it's good even to take a look at how how uh, the diagnoses are made and what's the level of confidence about the uh, diagnosis. And finally, all the tumors are coded. So the system is able to assign numbers to the name of the tumor and the site of the tumor. And using a coding system that has been developed uh, for uh, animals, so the veterinary cancer coding system, and the beauty of that system is that it's aligned with uh, what humans are using for cancer registration. Uh, so the human coding system is called ICDO 3.2, and we have exactly the, the same numbers, terminology, and um, codes. Of course, there are some differences because in humans, they don't have tr the transmissible venereal tumor, for example. But those are just minor exceptions. So the importance of using the coding is that we, the A carcinome has high uh, level of standardization and comparability with other cancer registries. So even though in Portugal, they might have their diagnosis written in Portuguese, but then we use the same coding system, the same numbers, so we can actually compare our data. And it's important because, for example, if we want, along the way, if we want to compare the A carcinoma data with the human data, we are using the same language again. So for comparative studies, this coding system is actually quite important. Now, all those different data are then are converging into a final dashboard that is accessible to the public. So in the final dashboard, you have a summary of all those different information. And I want to show you a video that has been made by the UQ video production team. And we'll show you exactly uh, how the dashboard works and how you can play with it. And later on, I will show you where, how to access the dashboard. Welcome to A Carcinom. Are you looking for an easy and convenient way to find out more about cancer cases in dogs and cats? The Australian Companion Animal Registry of Cancers allows you to have important cancer data with just a few clicks. All the cancer data in the database are anonymous and de-identified. 
A carcinom can be used to, one, look at cancer trends over time, two, discover what groups are affected most by cancer, and three, find out where cancers are more common. Let's take a look around. Using the Acarcinom dashboard, you can visualise common cancers in cats and dogs for Australia as a whole or by state and territory. You can switch from canine to feline cancer data very easily. The top five types, or morphology, show the most common tumours in dogs and cats. When one of the top five types is selected, all the other graphs automatically change to show the most common site, breed, sex and age group for that particular tumour. Using the second graph, you can see in which part of the body cancer is more commonly found. And again, when one specific site is selected, all the other graphs dynamically change to show what is the type of tumour, breed, age and sex for that particular location. Do you want to know what breeds are more predisposed to cancer? The top 10 breeds graph can answer this question. You can also look at the sex predisposition or most commonly affected age at diagnosis. Want to see how cancer rates change over time? The monthly trend visualisation tool can also be adjusted for a specific date range. Using the Interactive Australia map, if we change state, all the other data will change to show you the most common type of tumour, tumour site, breed, age and sex for that particular state. Whether you are a dog or cat owner, a researcher, a veterinarian, a scientist, a carcinom is for everyone. So this is how the dashboard works. And you can actually have access to the dashboard or through the QR code or using the, um, uh, our website that has been built by uh, the Faculty of Science Marketing and Communication Office. So you can have access to the A-carcinom dashboard here, and then you can play with it. Um, we, had, we had it another feature, but it's last week. So it's, it's not on the video, but in addition to all the other features, you can actually even select the breed. So you can see in, in uh, the SAFI in Australia, how many cancer cases you have per site, and which is the most common tumor in staffy dogs, and even the most common site of the tumor. Um, it's also, you can use the reset button. There are information on the first page. So there are all those information on how to use the dashboard. And you can also, and it's going even deeper. So for example, if you want to know how many cases of muscle tumor in the skin in Queensland you have, then the dashboard is changing according to your request. So all those information uh, can be gained through the navigating uh, the A-carcinom dashboard. And this is for me. So what I can tell you is just to engage with the dashboard and contact us if you have any ideas on how to change the dashboard or if there is anything missing. And we are welcome to receive any feedback that you may have on our project as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ricardo Soares Magalhães and uh, also from the vet school. I'm the epidemiologist uh, support to Chiara's uh, acarcinome idea. And uh, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where we meet and pay my respects uh, to your elders past and present and emerging. So let me just fire up my presentation. So as I, as I was saying, the, the partnership is between a, patho a pathology specialist and an epidemiologist, uh, which sometimes uh, there's friction in terms of uh, vision and terminologies and, and, and how we um, want to uh, conceptualize the, the, the database and how we can then use the data to take uh, to make insights. And so what I would like to, to say is that we're not just celebrating the availability of a, a data asset. We're also celebrating the opportunities that come with the availability of that data asset. And this is what I'm going to focus on. 
And uh, I've been learning a lot through the, in the past uh, couple of years in terms of uh, cancer epidemiology. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. So for me, it's been really rewarding being part of this, of this project. So in epidemiology, we're always concerned about these three things. Uh, we want to profile individuals or group of individuals with respect to when they get exposures, where the exposures happen, and what sort of demographics are at higher risk of those exposures. We also like to measure things. We love stats. We like to understand uh, whether particular groups of individuals have higher incidence or prevalence of a particular condition. So we call them the measures of disease uh, frequency. Uh, but also we want to understand uh, what sort of risk factors are more associated with the presence of the exposure in particular subgroups of the population. So one of those important risk factors is indeed genetic, the genetic risk factors in the context of cancer, which is very dissimilar to infectious diseases. So there's a very strong genetic component, but there's also a really important environmental component. Uh, from the literature, we, we know that about 16% uh, the attributable risk of cancer comes from the environment. It's about 1.7 million people die every year of an environmental uh, carcinogenic sort of substance or uh, condition or exposure or hazard. So for us in cancer, we see things a little bit different. And, uh, and the, this is what we call the epidemiological triad. So a carcinome really sits at the center there. It's providing the, the information, the data, that then will allow us to link these different factors to the data and make, and, and make those insights. Um, so the measures of disease frequency that we can get from, the, from a carcinoma and other registries um, can be summarized in different ways. But for us to be able to summarize, we need to have a case definition. And that's what the project has been really um, spending most of the time uh, is getting the vocabulary correct so that we are talking about the same entity so we can count those entities. So we have exact measures of incidence uh, for a particular cancer for a particular demographic group. With that, if we've got the measures of frequency, we can understand distribution, geographical and temporal distribution. We can understand what may be the, the, the positive, the positive uh, risk factors associated with the exposure, but also understand treatment efficacy and prognosis if we link the registry to clinical information, which, which we hope to do in the next year. So that's one of the sort of um, uh, short-term horizon milestones. Now, as, me as mentioned by our executive dean, um, cancer registries have, have been in the, in the, in, in emerging in the last century, uh, but we, we have information about cancer and, and, and per uh, perhaps not considered as cancer the, from way before 16th, 17th century. And so the, the cases I have there is really how people and physicians perceived the, the condition of cancer and then associated the observations with a particular exposure. So much, much of the reasoning there was in a way inductive, joining the dots. But uh, what we really want to do uh, in, in modern science, in epidemiology, is not just joining the dots. We want to test the hypothesis, right? So it's more of a deductive reasoning. And for that, we design studies, conduct them. And these are just some of the, the types of studies that in human medicine um, have been uh, particularly implemented to be able to ascertain those risk factors. Much of this work has been done on the backs of existing registries. So having a carcinoma will allow us to do uh, case control sort of designs, but also understanding communities where pets are a higher risk and do cohort studies and follow them over time to understand those exposures that are more nuanced and more subtle. So in terms of um, the, the, um, what a carcinoma has been able to overcome so far, and Chiara also mentioned about that, is three things. One is the case definition. Now we have a, a common vocabulary um, that we can uh, code the cancer types and we can uh, distinguish those entities from, from, from the, the words that are being used by our colleagues, uh, uh, the, the, the pathologists. And, uh, and then we can look at distribution of this outcome of interest. We can, and Kiara has shown you, we can do the mapping, uh, we can do some uh, nice uh, plots over time as well, and we can do stratification of the incidence between groups of animals, between breeds and age groups. 
Now, what we can't do yet, and but we're sort of um, going in that direction, is linking the registry to a possible exposure data. So this is the, the, big, the big step that, that uh, we would like to, to undertake and the big opportunity ahead of us. Um, so we understand the distribution of exposures, we have the nature of exposure, the concentration type, and also the timing of where those exposures may happen. As opposed to infectious diseases, cancers, ca ca there's a lag effect. So e exposure may happen uh, on a continuous basis or perhaps in a few years before, and then the event of the notification or the, the, the appearance of the case in the registry comes many years later. So understanding those lag effects and linking correct data to, to understand those lag effects is really, really important. So a carcinoma now enables those studies to be, to be conducted and having that epidemiological national representative routine collected data from pathology is when one way to do it. Now, there's a number of challenges that we can't solve, uh, but they are solved in a way in the human space. Cancer in, in, uh, in animals is not reportable. Right? Uh, there's no mandatory reporting, so in a way we need to tap into uh, the pathology laboratory re records to be able to ascertain and to extract that information that, that is to make those studies. The other, the other thing is the variation, the efforts, right? Not all owners want to pursue treatment all the way or diagnose if the animal is unwell. So we lose all of that information along the way. Uh, then there's a, the challenge of enumerating the population at risk. So if you want to est estimate incidence and compare incidence across different regions, across different breeds, we need to adjust for the background population, the at-risk population. We don't have yet an, a harmonized number of dogs per geographical unit that we can easily obtain and adjust for that incidence. So these are things that we haven't solved but obviously there's the opportunity there to engage with partners to then look into these aspects here. Now, why are these studies important? Well, um, it will be representative of the cancer burden in companion animals. Uh, we're pushing data from our partners, which is relatively quick and, and cheap as opposed to doing surveys and to going out there and spending thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars running surveys, uh, and allows this record linkage with existing platforms, such as investments done by ARVC, uh, such as the Vet Compass system that we have across Australia. Now, there's a number of challenges and, and, and a big, big leaps have been done in this space with respect to a carcinome, which is that dissonant data vocabulary. We have that harmonized information now available, so we can uh, ascertain which entities we're talking about. Um, we have a number of variables available that is generally limited, so it's a registry. What uh, arrives to a pathology lab obviously is not the, it's not the clinical history. There will be some notes there perhaps from the attending veterinarian to the pathologist, but that's usually not the case. But we have important information in terms of the profile of the individual that is affected, the when that diagnosis was made, and also the place of residence in regards to the postcode, right? So this provides us a lot of opportunities in terms of spatial epidemiological studies um, to understand geographical and spatial temporal variation uh, in the cancer incidence. So in spatial epi, what we like to do is examine those geographical variations in cancer incidence and provide important etiological clues. This needs to be made in a parenthesis here because that is a, an ecological approach whereby we link secondary data to existing registry data to ascertain associations between exposure and the outcome of interest, right? But it will allow us to understand the risk factors of exposure, which many of them are inherently spatial. So I've talked about the genetic component of cancer, but many cancers, um, as I mentioned, they have an environmental sort of uh, attrib attribution or risk attribution. And so we'll be able to ascertain that environmental gradient of exposure having this registry available. 
And in terms of an, an analysis, this is what we usually do in spatial epidemiology. We start by gathering information. The registry is right there at the top, the databases. We start by making maps, visualization stage. The maps will tell us some, or will give us some insights. Perhaps the incidence of cancer seems to be clustered in these locations. So we test for clustering, doing what we call exploration. And then if the clusters are present, we would like to understand why they are there. And so we uh, do those, those secondary data linkages to model the, the geographical distribution and look at associations between particular factors within the clusters of cancer out, uh, compared to that outside of, of the clusters. So the, this brings us a number of opportunities, epidemiological opportunities. And, and I've summarized them here on this slide, and I'm going to go through them one at a time uh, just to explain what those opportunities are and several partners here in the room, I guess, will be able to understand them and perhaps engage more directly with the team so we can plan uh, what we can do into the next uh, sort of horizon one of the next stage of the project. So one thing is about we are providing an enhanced and that I, 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 I was unsure if I would like uh, to capitalize that that first word. It's an enhanced geographical coverage or representativeness of the available information we have at the moment. And, and the reason for that is that there's many ways of doing registries. One is through hospitals, so obviously biased to those that are under treatment. Another one is through pathology reports. It's that this is what we're doing here with a carcinome. And another one is set, setting up a population-based study and we follow that population over time. It's very expensive, but it's done in some human cancers and it's highly effective. But what, we, what we're doing at the moment with, uh, in, in Australia in terms of cancers is through the Vet Compass system. And so this is just a map for uh, urothelial cell carcinoma. And this is some work done by our postdoctoral fellow, K.O. Wada, there at the back of the room. And as you can see, there's a number of gaps on that map. We can see some color, which shows you where incidence is happening using clinical records, the hospital-based sort of registries, that there's a whole area around the, the, um, the remote and rural areas of Australia that are largely uh, unknown in terms of this cancer. That's just the nature of clinical records, right? So they are as good as the clinics that participate in the system and the coverage of that system. So a carcinome is, is coming in to fill the gaps in relation to that coverage and that representativeness. The other big advancement in or opportunity with a carcinome is our ability to have highly granular, spatially disaggregated incidence data, right? So we would like to do this at ASA2 level for two reasons. As it says there, community interacts socially, economically, and usually exposures operate at that scale there. If people live long enough in those locations and, and animals as well. So the other reason is that we would like to do compar comparative studies with the human data as well. And they are captured at SA2 level as well. So our work is really looking at a geographical scale that allows us to ascertain exposures and lags in exposure, as well as the comparative work uh, with the human information. And Kiara just showed you the, the click button, but I reassure you that the information will not just be at that level. There will be information uh, a little bit more granular for studies moving on into the future. The other aspect here is the linkage, the data linkage I mentioned to you. So some cancers operate at very high clustered sort of locations. Radiation, for example, and cases of radiation in human, in human health um, usually operate at very small scales unless the, the exposure happens through an environmental sort of vehicle that expands geographically, but usually they're quite circumscribed. So, Having that data linkage that is within a cluster and investigating it further after that data linkage and uh, identifies the cluster is really critical for subsequent cohort studies. The other aspect here is to estimate what the epidemiologists call the population attributable fraction, which is the proportion of cases that could be averted if we stopped that exposure. 
Yeah? So it allows us to understand that. How many cases can we avert in relation to stopping that exposure from happening? So we've been doing some work, and again, Kay has been assisting us with that, with urothelial cell carcinoma using the VET compass data, remember, and its, its, its gaps. We are able to find signals, for example, in the uh, PM 2.5, which is an indication of pollution or a concentration of a pollutant, and the incidence of that particular canine, uh, cancer in canines. So it, it allows us to understand those signals. Um, we can do much more with this information if the geographical coverage and the temporal variation in the exposure and the outcome uh, are, are adequate. Other things we can do, and that's opportunity four, is the development of um, cancer visualization methods. The, the version that Chiara is showing is, is in a way the beta 1.1 version. And we are hoping to invest further with the help of partners on the dashboard. So it looks something like the, the current human dashboard, which is fabulous, fantastic. And Kerry's team has, has been spearheading this work at QUT, um, which allows us to look at geographical variation, but also um, benchmark locations compared to other locations. Are these locations above or below a threshold of risk? Um, and then these are, in a way, decision support systems that allow clinicians, the profession, understand I'm operating in a population that has a higher than normal incidence of this particular cancer, so I better be aware of something that is coming through the doors, right? The other, the other thing with these uh, spatial decision support systems is that we can cater the access to data depending on the user type. So what we have at the moment is the public facing sort of uh, uh, a model that Kiara showed, but we can have different um, ac data access facilities to, different, to researchers, to our partners, and reporting systems that are adequate for the activities they do on a day-to-day -day basis. The other aspect is the linkage, and this has been mentioned several times, and the opportunity to do what we call uh, comparative ongoing epidemiological studies um, using this paradigm of animals as possible potential sentinels of human cancers because of their short-lived uh, lifespan compared to human beings, but also because of their intimate relation to environmental exposures compared to humans. So, and this, this work, we've started already engaging with our colleagues at, at QUT uh, to do these studies um, that will kick off uh, first thing uh, throughout the year using the, the model data that is available uh, through the, the, the Human um, uh, Cancer Atlas. I'm just showing you here uh, very preliminary work, again, using that urothe urothelial cell carcinoma and the, the map on the top is the, is the map I showed you before, the, the distribution of the canine cancers, and the map, map at the bottom corresponds to uh, the same cancer, but in human beings. So clearly there could be some comparative co-distribution studies uh, to be uh, focused on particular communities where we look at the highest incidence in both human and, and animals. Just in conclusion, and I think I'm still on time, right? Yes. Um, three things. Is, it, is, it, is, it represents a critical national cancer digital infrastructure, as, as mentioned by, by our, our vice, vice uh, chancellor in research uh, infrastructure. Um, it is, uh, it, it's, it's, it's here to create change, create change in the way um, a companion animal uh, uh, cancer care uh, can be seen into the future and also uh, the epidemiological knowledge that we can derive from this information uh, in three ways. One is harness the power of studies using routinely collected data, consolidation of the case definitions, which was critical, so it's there. Second, the opportunity for these secondary data linkages to occur, so we can understand pot potential risk factors, local risk factors that we could follow up with randomized controlled trials or cohort studies. And, and then uncover these uh, profile, temporal, and sort of place variations in cancer. 
then the development of the dashboard, right? So it's engaging with our partners in terms of what they would like to have out of the data that is available, right? That would suit their needs. So being patient-centered if we're looking at owners, but also being profession-centered. We can use this as well as a teaching tool in a, in a, at UQ and other universities are also partnering with us. And finally, I guess, it's the, the, the comparative on epidemiological studies and um, possibly leveraging health funding, right? Because it's always hard to uh, do research in the, in the cancer space in, in, in animals, uh, but perhaps we can do bigger, bigger studies aligning ourselves with our colleagues in the human cancer epidemiology and, and then uh, test these hypotheses. Can, can, can we use animals as, as the canary in a coal mine for, for human cancer? So that's, that's, I think that's all for me. And, and I think we'll take some questions uh, now. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, it's it's a, a real pleasure um, and, uh, and an honor to be here as part of this, uh, this project. Uh, you know, this is such an important project and it really touches so many of our, our personal lives, but also the epidemiology and the cancer uh, uh, is so important, not just for animals, but also, uh, as as Ricardo said, the the link then with the human cancer as well. So I've been um, proud to be part of the collaboration uh, in building the Australian Cancer Atlas, and this has been uh, co-led with the Cancer Council Queensland and uh, the Australian Cancer uh, Registries. And again, like this uh, this project here bringing together different uh, registries uh, so that we can have a national profile of about 20 different cancers across Australia at the SA2 level, so about 2,000 odd small areas, uh, looking at incidence and relative survival. And uh, we're about to release next year that the, we have a spatial version of that that was released a couple of years ago, and there'll be a spatio-temporal version of that released um, next year, early next year. And uh, linking that then to uh, this project is really exciting. To think of the potential that we have to be able to understand much more about cancer um, will be, uh, you know, potentially a revolution in both the animal world and the human world. Um, what we've been able to do with the Australian Cancer Atlas then is to look at the geographic variation and to see where there are differences, like really different spatial uh, variation in incidence and survival. And what we found is that there is a lot of difference in, in survival across the country in urban areas and rural and regional areas. And I mention this because by picking up that, that relative difference, being able to build a platform that can demonstrate that kind of variation, and then to be able to quantify how many lives could be saved if we didn't have that kind of spatial variation. Why should we have that um, difference in where you live determines your, your relative survival from cancer? If we didn't have that, what would difference would that make? That was picked up by the, the media and, um, and led to a change in policy, which was a change in the rebate, an increase in the rebate for people in uh, rural and remote areas to be able to access treatment for cancer. And so I see that these kinds of platforms really have an opportunity to change not just our research and not just our, our practice, but also the policy as well. And I look forward to working more closely with, uh, with our carcinoma as it goes forward, being able to, to um, build those kinds of insights through a carcinoma, but also then to be able to link it to uh, what we know about the, uh, the, the, Australia, uh, the Australian cancer scene as well for humans. Um, I'm only a small cog in the wheel. There's many, many people uh, that are involved in both this team and also the Australian Cancer Atlas team. I'm proud to be part of both of them. Thank you. I think we'll start the uh, Q&A session and we'll open the floor uh, both to people online and and the and the audience we have here in the room. Any any anyone would like to ask a question or a clarification or just a comment? Yes. Hi, 
Hi there, thank you very much. All very, uh, very interesting. Um, I wondered uh, if I could clarify, first of all, that the fundamental building block of this whole database will be pathology or, or specialist pathologist interpreted and confirmed diagnoses. That'll be the fundamental building block, is that right? Yes. That's correct. Yeah. So is there, has there been any consideration given to incentivising general practitioners, which will be the, bro the broadest sweep of, of veterinary practitioners across the country in submitting samples for pathology? Um, not at this stage, because we are just working on the pathology report that they have been submitted to the lab. So using some, we are, we're going to work with retrospective data and with the prospective data, we're just relying on the samples submitted to the pathology labs. IDEX so, and Gribbles only at the moment. And the university lab. And university lab. Yes. Yeah. So the so we are working on histopathology samples, biopsies, and necropsy. So we can combine using the academic institutions and the commercial labs, we combine the biopsy side and the necropsy samples because, for example, Grib Gribbles and IDEX, they are not doing necropsy, right? Or postmortem examination. So there's a missing piece of information that will be covered by the academic institutions where, you know, uh, maybe post-mortem uh, samples are the bulk of the samples that uh, they get and we get as uh, academic institutions. But it's just relying on the samples submitted to the pathology labs. And not and aspirates, only... Only, only histopathology biopsy samples, yes. We didn't end... We didn't go with the cytology because, and we know that there is a bias there because, for example, many leukemia cases are diagnosed by cytology only. So we, we might not have that piece of information. Let me, maybe we'll, we'll add that later on. But we started with the histopathology because in many cases it's the gold standard test for confirming the diagnosis. So we had to start from something that was standardized. Um, but in the future, I think that we might need to add cytology cases into the picture. And I think that it's coming, taking a look at the data and see what, what, how, how many cases of one particular tumor we have, and what's missing. Um, because, you know, the problem is that cancer is not reportable. So all the human cancer registries, uh, they are getting data even from diagnostic imaging labs, and we don't have that. So we wanted to start with the pathology lab just for the sake of standardization. And is the intent to extend the, the number of providers, like QML, for example? Yes, we are, we're happy to have um, other partners involved in the project. We, I got, for example, an email from the University of Massey because they said, Oh, we would like to, to give our New Zealand-based data. So we have Australian and New Zealand uh, cancer data. So I think that once we have the dashboard in place, other providers uh, can come in. And the system is working very well, even with messy pathology reports, including UQ reports. You know, If I'm looking back at retrospective pathology reports with lots of free text, it's, it's very tricky to get uh, data from there. So I'm expecting that this system is, is able to work with any type of pathology report now because it has been trained with so many different formats that just in case if there is anyone who wants to jump in and be partner on the project, there might not be any issues with that. Let me just check some uh, questions. There, many, there were many comments about, oh, we can't see the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'll, I'll get, I'll get. Forward. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'm Mark Krockenberger. I, I chair um, Vet Compass Australia, which is a, um, a collaboration amongst all the veterinary schools um, around health data. And this is a fantastic example of the burgeoning ecosystem, I suppose, of um, digital health uh, in pets and how it can um, be brought together in a really nice way, as, as Chiara and, um, 
and Ricardo have, have, have demonstrated. I think the points that you make are excellent. And I think that's uh, a really good example of how we need to view these initiatives as part of an overall ecosystem. So I don't know if you know about Fair Compass, but it tries to build some of that clinical data in, um, as you say, at the moment that is lost. And, and Ricardo spoke about lost information. There are many ways of gathering information. I think you're right. General practice is a really important place. I think it goes beyond cancer. This is a great example of animal health in general. Um, I love the analogy that you made, Ricardo, about the, the, the canary in the coal mine, because of course that's, that's one of the big drivers for all of us in animal health is, is, is what sort of effect does that show us about animal health. So I think um, I'm, I've been very happy to be involved in this project because I see it as part of that ecosystem of digital health and answering the sorts of questions that you're raising. Any any questions, the people online, while we move the the microphone to another question here? Any questions online? Please uh, place them in the chat box, and we'll address them as we when we can. Could be an easy question. How far back is the data already? So it's now, yeah. I need to go back. now we are working on a small data sets. So the, the one that you see in the dashboard is, it contains only few data. Now, it depends on the institution. It depends on uh, how long they had the electronic database. For example, it, uh, for UQ, it's from 1994. Uh, Murdoch University, uh, 25 years, I think. Uh, 25 years, it, it depends on the electronic records because we don't want to go back to the paperwork. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that might be a bit tricky, uh, but the last 20 years uh, for the retrospective data from the different institutions, we're expecting to get the last 20 years. And how much does the data have to be manipulated for the data entry? And now, not much because it's, part of the vocabulary strategy. So the, um, okay. so we look, yes, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, I can give yeah, just yeah, a yeah, brief yeah, comment. Yeah. Uh, so the system, uh, if we talk about the manipulation and the issues with data extraction from the different pathology reports, um, if we realize that there is something different in terms of the pathology report from the past, we can retrain the machine, saying, look, the pathology report looks a bit different, so the name of the tumor is now in a different place. Uh, you need to be able to recognize that. So we might be able eventually, if there are big differences in terms of uh, format, the format of the pathology report, we are able to uh, change how the system is extracting data. And that's one piece of the puzzle. The other one is that the platform is recognizing all the different uh, names of the tumors and site, even the ones that change along the way. So the research, voca the vocabulary that we've been, we have built is made up of all the different terminologies even looking at the past terminology, even the American British English exceptions. So there might not be any issues in terms of data extraction, even if the nomenclature has changed compared uh, to what we had 20 years ago. Do you want to add anything else? No, I think, I think you, covered, okay. you, you covered really well. Just, just to add that it was initially supervised by human beings, right? So to generate the vocabularies, but yeah, now it's a, a human yeah, and <laughs> yes, human beings, and but there's the data model behind it, right? So uh, there's a, a parser that separates the different entities into the the, the site, the, the the grading, but it's totally automated. If there's if there's a change, the system will flag that change, and then the human being will go in and identify what's what's different with this. Uh, so we we can ingest data from pretty much any 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 partner in any format yeah
So if there's any like spelling errors in the original reports, that's... The vocabulary is, is taking into account even that yes. one. Yeah. Because we went back, so I went back to um, the many, looking at many pathology reports from UQ. So, and I realized that there were many things uh, like, you know, spelling errors or mistakes. So the vocabulary is, is taking into account even those mistakes. And actually the, the system, so before committing data into the final database, there is always a human checkpoint. And the system is flagging that. So the database is flagging with nice, I don't know. It's a color scheme. Yes, like and, the, and little alert. logos, little logos as well. Little logos or alert. Yeah. Uh, in this case, the diagnosis it's not in the pathology report. Let's check that particular case. So there is always a human double check of the final data, because you know sometimes, um, just to give you an example, when we have a skin tumor. This, the, the tumor may come from the epithelium, so from the surface, or from the connected tissue, but it's skin anyway. But they do have different codes. So the machine now knows that tumor arising from the epithelium should be, should have, the skin should have one code, and from deep in the derm, it should have a different code. But sometimes, you know, even the machine can make mistakes. But there is always someone else like double checking that it's actually capturing the correct side of the tumor. No questions online at the moment. Any other questions? Yes, Nigel? Ricardo, what, what are the options to estimate or gain access to a population at risk? Oof. So, uh, different states do things differently, and I'm sure though the veterinarians in the room will understand that in terms of dog registrations. There's different systems of microchipping and da different databases. Look, this is a, th that would be a, a separate project altogether, and perhaps ARDC would like to help us with that. Because bringing, <laughs> bringing e exactly, because that's, that's essential for anything we do in, uh, in terms of... Um, understanding disease, right? Understanding disease, understanding the, where the populations are. And, um, and so that information exists, right? But it's fragmented, is, uh, and different states have different ways of um, custodianship. So that, that would require a, a tremendous effort, but it's not impossible, right? And it's digitalized, so it's not paper-based. So the systems are there. We just need to have that, th those conversations within the profession and within the different states and, and bring all the, the data together. So, but what we're currently doing, and this is effort from the team as well, is approximating, approximating incidents based on number of submissions. So at the moment, incidents, it, the, the, the adjusting factor is the number of submissions that have been uh, uh, made in, in that particular geographical location that, within that particular time. So that's not ideal, right? Uh, another, another uh, approach we took before was uh, make adjustments based on the human population. So the map I just showed you there on the slide is the world pop uh, map that provides uh, one kilometer pixel uh, human density. And so if we know on average that Queensland, you know, dog ownership is X per capita, we can do that adjustment, which is not ideal either. So, but yeah, that would be a project that I think it's, it's again, another, another critical uh, national infrastructure that should be put in place, very much what we have with NLIS in cattle. So, um, but yeah, happy, yeah, happy, yeah. happy to talk about that. And yeah, because a carcinoma is not a population-based cancer registry, yeah. so it would be ideal to have that, but it's going to be very hard. It's a pathology-based. Yeah, but not impossible. No. Yeah. Because we don't have the population. Like I mean, the correct information about the population. Yeah, no, I'm still...
Um, yeah. I think I think you mentioned that you were going to look at um, including sort of clinical data as well. Is that right? How are you going to approach that? Because yes. I guess getting that data. Yes. Is going to be a bit so you you queue you queue with the other seven vet schools uh, around Australia. We are partners of the Vet Campus system, which is the Australian um, clinical record uh, surveillance system, right? Um, so one intuitive next step would be working with the laboratories and the submitters and looking at the microchip information. Can we link, right? But that's that's the problem. Sometimes the microchip information doesn't travel with the with the request to the laboratory. So, but I guess we can work within the participating practices within Vet Campus and making sure that future submissions to our partner labs go with the microchip information. So we can plan ahead and 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 have that in place. Now that we have a registry in place, we can do so many things. So, uh, yeah. So for like a clinician, if they're submitting a biopsy sample, <laughs> potentially the new forms will have, you know, their new. That's right. Or advocating for that to happen yeah. through the through the vet campus system that Mark Mark chairs. Because one, one thing that would be very, very nice to explore is uh, the, what's the response to treatment, the survival right? Survival. That, that is missing now in, at this stage in the e-carcinome database, but that's a very important piece of information for oncologists. And think about the practical application of data. So having like, if you have a dashboard that tells you, you know, the survival rate for this tumor is this. If you apply this type of treatment, that will be very, very useful. So that's something that we can plan for the future. No comments online so far. Um, I yes. got a question. Uh, so do you think about collecting more information from owners? For example, uh, in many research from um, people under long-term stress will uh, have uh, systematic information and which is uh, maybe trigger for the uh, cancer. And if animals can feel this stress from their owners, do they have, uh, are they prone to um, have cancer more quickly, Sometimes, something like that? And this may be involved uh, like owners' jobs or salary income, kind of those information. Yes, well. Um, I can answer this you, you go for it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm giving you an example. For example, Beton Connect in Portugal, and even Take Charge in US, they do have two parallel systems for data capture. One is from the pathology labs, and the other one is from the owners. So they have like a survey. So the owner can go to the website and they can fill a form if they, their dogs or cats have cancer. That relies on the owner. Mm. It's, it's a lot of job for them to fill out the uh, questions, to answer the questions, and even the accuracy of the questions, because our experience last year with the survey we ran a survey um, asking questions about uh, potential environmental factors of cancer in dogs. And that survey was for the owners. So we got back questions about, do you smoke or do you use this product? What's the diet of the dog? Has your dog been diagnosed with cancer? All those sorts of questions. And we got, I mean, more than 300, 300. Respon responses. It was pretty good. But then looking at data, the info the <laughs> one of the most important questions was not always uh, answered. Like, what type of tumor? I don't know. Or, you know, it, it, so now we, we have lots of data about potential environmental factors, but we can't really link those factors with actual tumors. So because it's it's a big ask uh, for the owner that asking to, it's a lot to uh, ask and they might not remember what, what's the name of the tumor uh, of your dog, you know? 
and re we rely on that information to, to draw some meaningful conclusions. So it's a bit tricky um, because you have 50% of the owners who are very good at keeping track of everything and 50% who don't remember many pathology um, information about the animals. So it might be ideal because from the owners, we can get all those information that you don't have in the request form or in the pathology reports, but it's going to be tricky. For the accuracy of data, yeah. I, it's a shame because we have lots of information and Kai can talk about that, and, but we can't link any specific tumor with a risk factor because in many cases, we don't have that piece of information about the tumor, the name of the tumor. So what, what you're alluding to, and, and also Chiara, is that, that issue of information bias. But I think uh, one opportunity with, with a carcinome is doing those initial studies to understand the distribution, spatial temporal distribution of se sev several entities. And then um, be very targeted, you know, risk-based in terms of studies like the one you're proposing, whereby if there is evidence that th that particular entity or cancer has an association with stress, we could carry out a cohort study within that hotspot and follow animals over time and do those questionnaires and so on. But we would need to consult with, I guess, with our colleagues from the human cancer space, because I, I think there's a lot of experience already in, in doing these prospective cohort studies at measuring right exposures and over time. So that's 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 where the, 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 the big engagement needs to, to come. So th that sort of work has been done already. So we can piggyback and use similar tools so that we can compare, right? Particularly if we want to do a, a One Health sort of study, so we can you know, have that validation from, from the human colleagues. Yeah. I, I think that's a fantastic question. And, um, and what it shows really is, um, is the, the, this kind of, um, platform and the inspiration that this gives to those kinds of questions. You know, it, it inspires us to ask these kinds of questions and then to look for ways that we can actually address them. Um, one of the things, and, and you know, we can learn from each other from the, the animal world and the human world, be great. Um, but also one of the things we're doing with the, uh, the Australian Cancer Atlas is a while ago we, we thought, well, we do have this issue of we, we, we know in the, in, and from this as well, we sort of know the what and the where, but what we don't know is the why. And, um, and so what we've asked to also for the Australian Cancer Atlas, the human one, is like, well, well what are some of the factors that are influencing um, and associated with cancer? And we can only do it at that sort of small area level rather than the individual level. But we said, well, what if we have this kind of platform and we can geotag people's stories to it. So imagine now that you have something where you're geotagging the stories. We have the, the, the facilities now, the tools, to be able to, um, you know, extract information from those stories and to be able then to match them or to, to uh, combine them with the data. And so we're, we're looking now at how we can geotag stories um, about human cancer, maybe that's something we can look at here as well. So it's cool, except in, this, in the Australian cancer one, when we started talking about it, we had the, the, um, the issue of, well, we need to provide sort of support for people to be talking about their stories because it's, um, it's, uh, it can be distressing and that's absolutely true. And at that point, like I'm a statistician and so I had to bow out of it and go, <laughs> well, we have to leave it for a little while until we could get those, that in place. But we have the... Uh, the Cancer Council Queensland and all the counselling services on board with that. And I'm sure that it's a similar sort of thing here. You know, there's lots of ways that this can be extended and it's really exciting to see something like this, which, which when you talk about it as a, as a sort of an, an idea um, is one thing to go, yeah, let's create this. But then it's like, oh, we have to go through and you had to, you know, kudos to you two for driving this and, and the team, the big team, for driving this through to something that's actually realised here that can allow us to dream and to answer these kinds of questions, to be inspired. It's great. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Uh, the other thing I would like to say is that this data linkage can also occur through existing ARDC projects. And I'm thinking about, for example, Eco Commons, particularly looking at environmental exposures. Eco Commons is a platform. Uh, 
um, developed by uh, colleagues from several universities. I think the I think UQ is part of that as well. Um, but it assembles environmental data, right, um, and landscape data, and so we can we can work with other partners within the ARDC environment to to ex execute those those studies and. Uh, because I think that the prevention is something that is missing in animal health, in the animal health space. We don't talk about prevention much because we don't know what to prevent, right? So if we start looking at data, that we, we can get so many important information for mm. prevention. And that's maybe something that uh, it's going to be a very uh, you know, important topic in the future. More preventive medicine than uh, treating. Sorry for the oncologist, because I'm not. <laughs> I'm still in your job. <laughs> it's not that I don't want to treat anymore, but if we can prevent cancer, I think that it's, it's something that might be quite impactful even for animal health. How long do you hope to have funding for? Obviously, you don't want to be like the past data sets have gone. Yeah, so the, the project has been primarily funded by um, the, Austra the Australian Research Data Commons uh, through the platforms, uh, for, through uh, the platforms um, um, program. program. Uh, unfortunately, that funding is coming to an end this year. So we'll be actively looking for support uh, to continue develop, developing the platform. And so um, for those of you listening online and those here, um, we would be excited to partner with you uh, for, for piecemeal projects or perhaps for bigger uh, uh, ideas um, that could constitute, you know, add, adding value to the existing asset. And um, so there's areas that those opportunities I mentioned, those five opportunities, you can just start thinking about, you know, where, where we can go. This is a national infrastructure, so that means uh, national support is required, right? So we've got university partner, partners and uh, private laboratory uh, sort of uh, support as well in terms of in-kind, in it's all in-kind, yeah. right? Um, but if we want to continue using this information to enact change in the, in the care, uh, we do need that, that long, long, more, more long-standing support. And can yeah. these laboratories sustain the staff requirements or, or other requirements that they need to, to push this data up? Uh, the, 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 the collation and, and passing the data to a carcinome, my understanding is that it's, it's, it's easy and, and cheap to do, right? So the in-kind contribution is, is really the data, the data that comes in because data is value, right? That data is already... Uh, and uh, upload is not going to happen every week. Yeah. So I could, depending on the situations, situation in the different institution, uh, labs can upload data every month, every three months, every six months. And it really, it doesn't take too much time, I think, uh, to do that. At least it's my experience because from a data provider perspective, they don't need to do the selection of cancer cases. So they are downloaded cases in dogs and cats, and then the system is extracting cancer cases only. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a, you know, a time consuming process. Yeah, because that would be such a burden. Because it would be such a burden. And we know that if you are thinking about academic institutions and pathology labs within academia and commercial labs, they do have their diagnostic service to run. So it, it's impossible to ask them to add this burden of extracting data every week, right? Or to do a manual extraction of data. Mm -hmm. So we thought about it, how to make the data extraction uh, very easy from the data provider perspective as well. Thank you. So the cost moving into the, into the future is, is these additional projects that we can do uh, improving the quality of the information we have, but also the, the insights we can get from, from the existing repository and the value add we can provide to, to partners. That's where the funding will be channeled to. Yeah. Any, any other questions you have? No?
<laughs> what? <laughs> this is, I tried the pull up banner yesterday at home because I'm pretty scared about the banners. So, yes, it's not the first time that this happens to that. Yes, it happened to me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just closing remarks. I'm go. just very glad that um, we were able to organize this launch event today with all of you and uh, people on Zoom. I'm, I'm so sorry that the Zoom people that they haven't had the opportunity to uh, see our my, my presentation, but we're going to record everything anyway. So, and the video is going to be shared on the website so everyone can have access to it. Uh, thank you very much again. Thanks for coming because I know that uh, some people flew in for this launch event. It has been great to see finally you here uh, face to face. And thanks for the help and support so far. Do you want to add anything else? Just, just uh, thank you again for for being present. And um, and it's really exciting to have a carcinoma out into the world. And yes. um, and we look forward to in continuing engaging with all the partners and and uh, thanking uh, very deeply for your patience and um, and for your commitment. Not believing in that it would be possible to create the first uh, cancer registry for companion animals in Australia. So it's it's here. Let's make make the best use of it. And so we're really looking forward to continue this collaboration and the engagement um, into the next few years. Well, thank you and 